You know, uh, some of you might not know, but you know, Kevin has served um, as a worship leader for us in Acts 242 for a number of years, and then also here at, at Westland. And um, one of the things that we had always talked about in our times was, uh, what is it that we sing? Um, and we had done reviews on the things that, that we sing, and we'd always tried to pick songs, you know, that we felt were like biblically faithful songs that you could take to the bank. These are the songs that you could sing in the hospital bed or outside if we were gathered together as a group, songs that would honor the Lord, you know, with every single uh, line. I love the last song that we just sang, you know, in Before the Throne of God Above. It speaks about, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free because God the just is satisfied to look on him and then to pardon me. He says, you just think about the depth of some of these words. Some of the songs that we sang are very new, you know, written in the last 10 years, and some we have sang are hundreds of years old, right? And they have one theme, one, one thing in common in them, as they tell the riches of Christ and the glories of what he has done for us and saving us for our, uh, saving our souls. I hope that these things, you know, along with psalms and other things that we're going to be looking to introducing in the next, you know, few weeks and like months here at the church, will form like a solid repertoire for us as believers here at Westland that we can have memorized, that we will know, and that in good times and in bad times, we will always have a ready song on our lips that is scriptural with which we can use to face the times. So that's my hope as a church. Worship is not just something that we sing that makes us feel good. Worship, as the Bible teaches us, is warfare. It is making war against the ideas, the ideologies, and the thinking that run counter to Christ in this present world and arming us, you know, with melodies and lines, you know, that are equipped with razor sharp, I think, spiritual truth that will be with us when we need it the most. So worship is important, it's critical, it's warfare, and we sing. Well, church, as we prepare for today's sermon, if you have a Bible with you, please grab it, and you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 to 34, where we are going to be continuing on today in our sermon series in the Gospel of Matthew. So let me begin by a reading of the text. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have a smartphone app to Uh, Flip two, you can follow along, I believe, here probably on the screen, okay? Verses 27 to 34, let me read. This is the word. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came in, came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. But they went away, and they spread his fame throughout all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in all of Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. Thus far, the reading of God's word. You know, church, uh, you know, every week when I prepare myself to preach, you know, it's people, there are people always curious, you know, like, what does a pastor do all week and what do you do when it comes to sermon preparation? In one sense, it never changes every single week. When it comes to sermon prep, I will have to say that my heart actually goes down this same sort of gut-wrenching path all the time, and it never gets easier. In that, I take the text usually of Scripture, and I print it out for myself, or hold it there in my Bible, and I read it over to myself, and I count how many verses there are in it. And the first thing that happens to me is usually I feel a sense of terror. It's a terror because I say to myself, I'm like, God, I've just read like six, seven verses, and I've got to get up there on Sunday, and I have nothing to say. I'm looking at a blank page. Like, there's words on here. I'm going to get up and I read this thing. It's 14 seconds long. And then after that, I'm going to say, see you next Sunday. And I go, like, I, I, need, I need to see things. I don't see anything, like, in here. What do you have for your people? 
And it's torture, right, for me, because I, I go, I, I just don't want to babble on for 40 minutes about nothing, watch people fall asleep in the pews or, like, have an accident or something like that. You know, they say, like, you know, I'm just never coming back to this place. God must be boring. This thought runs through my mind every single week as I'm sitting there and I'm opening the text and I'm saying, please, God, I need to see something here. Give me fresh food, fresh fire. I can't serve up last week's meal, you know what I mean, and stuff like, you need fresh food, can't even do like those things you go to like save on. You buy those four-minute meals, right? You put them in the microwave. There's, you have to cook every single week. And so I begin. I sit there and I dissect the passage. I take it apart word by word. I look at it in Greek. I look at it in Hebrew. I retranslate it for myself. I look up any words that I, I, I don't remember because my languages get rusty or whatever. And, and, I, and I, I sit there and I, I look at it. I pour over it. And then I, then I, I write I begin writing, I'm like, God, what does this say here? What are you speaking to me? And then I go and I open commentaries, which are books, you know, that other biblical scholars have written, pastors themselves, and I read and I go, how does my heresy that I have here compare to the heresy that they have in another man's book, you know? And I look and I say, okay, that was wrong, Sam, you were completely out there. Oh, these guys are wrong here. And I look and I throw, what does it actually say? And as I do this, the, the fear that I have begins to transform. It transforms not just into like uh, pure unadulterated happiness, actually. It actually transforms from one kind of fear, I would say, into another in stage two. And it's the fear, actually, of having too much to say as I sit in and I soak in the presence and the awesomeness of God. And I see him everywhere, even in the text, and I say, I could talk about that, I could talk about that, I could go down this rabbit trail here, I have all these stories, you know, about amazing things, and I, and I go, that's, that's too much, actually, for one meal. The last thing that you want to do, you know, I mean, it's a terrible thing to go and to try to feed someone and to offer them, say, you just have one potato and you have one carrot, you know, this is, this is the meal that you're going to have. You can't starve people. But the last thing that you want to do also is like to have so much food, so rich, you know what I mean, that you say that you have to eat everything and it will make you sick as well. I mean, the human heart can only take so much, you know, at one time. Our attention spans are also short. It was great advice. I remember I said it was given to one of my preaching professors that I had. As his young son was preparing for the work of ministry, he said, son, advice for you, two things as a preacher. And he thought, okay, my son, my dad, 30 years in the ministry, what is this? He said, one, he said, son, if you're drilling for oil and you don't hit anything in 30 minutes as well, quit drilling, okay? So just don't go crazy long. The second part, he said with his son, was um, the head cannot, head and the heart cannot accept what the bum cannot endure. So make sure that when you preach and you get up and you speak the word of God, you are clear, you are concise, and you're speaking exactly what God wants you to give in that period of time to their people. It is a serious thing to present the word of God to people so that they can eat it and find delight in it in their souls. And so I can't share everything that I've said. I, whatever I take up into the pulpit is just a, a small portion of the amazing things that I've seen. And many times I feel after having been with God, uh, I feel a sense almost like what Moses must have felt when he stood on the mountain and he faced off with God and he spoke with him and was up there 40 days and 40 nights and he comes back down with these tablets of stone and the scriptures tell us that Moses' face is glowed with a supernatural light because he had stood in the presence of God. It was so bright that the Israelites actually had to have him cover his face because they couldn't actually stand in his presence. And I think that's what happens to us as Christians as we sit there and we dwell in the presence of God. All the saints whom I love so much who spend all their time in prayer because their bodies are breaking down and they, you know, just they, their only hope is left in God. They just radiate. They glow with something, an inner type of warmth and light that comes from knowing God. You know, I think it's one of the most marvelous things about encountering Christians. You know, a true Christian one of the characteristics of that is that they have learned how to feast on and to savor God and to absolutely delight in Him and to know Him. They have this strange, insatiable desire to eat and to even feast continually from God, and they will not leave until they have had their soul actually satisfied in Him. See, the true Christian echoes Jesus' declaration when He was fighting Satan in the wilderness and Jesus spoke to that tempter and said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And if you have known Christ, you know, for a number of years, and you've come to experience the reality of that, as, you know, sorrows like sea billows have just rolled over you in life, and you've found God's word to be sweet, pleasant, 
the sustenance and the anchor for your soul. You know exactly what that's like. You have feasted on God and you have found there's nothing else that can satisfy your hunger. See, you're not a Christian just because you attend church on Sundays. No more than if I were to put you in my garage, you know, home, I don't have a garage, but if I had one, if I were to put you in a garage, you don't turn into a car, right? See, a Christian is one who has been transformed from the inside. It's not just a matter of where you go and the rituals that you perform. It's about what's going on on the inside, what's under the hood. See, a Christian is one who has found that they have total forgiveness in the work and person of Jesus Christ on the cross, and they savor it, they love him, they celebrate him, and they realize that they have done nothing to earn this absolutely unmerited gift of grace and love and kindness, and they're overwhelmed that the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the creator of all the universe would even think to give them something like this. And so they worship and they celebrate with grateful hearts. So, as the Bible says, right, to all who believed him, who in his name he gave the right to become children, sons and daughters of the living God, that, that, when Christians hear that, they say, yes, that's me. See, To walk with old saints, to walk with real Christians who have loved God, I don't just ask about how many times you've gone to church in the last year, whether you attend a Bible study midweek, although I think it's a good thing, and you should, you should have disciplines. What I want to know from the Christian, as I look at them and I say, is there that glow? Have you been with Jesus? Is he your absolute delight? Do you take pleasure in hearing his sweet voice? And if that's taken away from you, you feel like your life, your very soul has been cut off from you. It's the Christian who says, you can take away my food, take away my job, take away my water, but do not take away from me, Jesus. I can live with, deprived of anything else, but I cannot live without him. And this is why Christians all throughout the centuries have been characterized by a time of gathering, being together, sitting around the word of God, singing the word of God to each other. And when they hear the word of God, you know, preach to them. They see a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist or a missionary lending their vocal cords to the service, engaging their body, waving their arms. But at the same time, a strange thing occurs in that they hear not just the preacher's voice, but they actually hear their Lord calling to them from the biblical text that has been opened up. And they forget that there's a man standing there, but here they just see their God. And they hear like the voice of God that just like thunders over the waters. The voice of God that breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of God that just rolls over like the seas. And, and you fall on your face and you say, I've, I've, I've met with him today. It's my prayer actually every time I come to the church on Sunday and I, I pray for God to speak during these messages. And as we talk and as we sing, I say, God, just, just talk to your people Talk to them in a way that they will understand. Let me decrease and may, they, may you increase here. You know, it's a privilege, brothers and sisters, to be believers who have the word of God. Now, as we've been going through the book of Matthew, and especially here, we have seen something in this gospel of Jesus actually documenting for us, uh, Matthew documenting for us the immense power of Jesus, like over death, over nature as he calms a storm. He's got power over diseases. He's got power over demons. But it's not just for the purpose of telling us a good story or even proving that he's a miraculous wonder worker. He certainly is. He does all these things. This section of God's word you know, that we just read here, though short, actually speaks to the magnificence of this God who has unrivaled and unmatched power in the universe, right? He's he, he, he is something that, not, that the world has never seen. And not only that, Matthew wants to show us that not only is God in human form immensely powerful, not only does his word as Jesus speaks have the power to raise the dead, but not only that, is that there is something that is taking place and shifting the very cosmos in that the kingdom of God is actually breaking into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, and the kingdom of darkness is moving into a position of full retreat, and the gates of hell are crumbling as he does his work. See, Jesus is not just a miraculous worker, nor even just a great teacher. He's a king, and in fact, he's a long-awaited king who is coming with an entourage of all of his servants, and he's bringing in an entire new world order, 
a kingdom that will replace and renew everything that we see under the sun. And you cannot fit this paradigm of kingdom living in any other sort of old paradigm. It does not fit with old Judaism. Other religions cannot explain it. It is so unique that Jesus says it is like new wine that cannot be stored in old wineskins. The only way to understand the kingdom is by understanding Christ's teachings on the kingdom and what the newness of the kingdom is going to look like and being able to humbly receive that, okay? But before we dig you know, into this and see how this works actually here in our text, I'd like to go back through our text just verse by verse and show, show you kind of what, it, what is here with regards to the kingdom and the power of Jesus, okay? So let's reread verses 27 and 29, okay? And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Now, now blindness was a very common problem in Jesus' time. On numerous occasions, you can read in the Gospels that Jesus healed people who were blind. They couldn't see. Like later on, you find in Matthew chapter 15, it says that the crowds brought to him people who were lame, they were crippled, the mute, and also they were blind. There's actually a parallel account to this that's found in Matthew 20 when Jesus is entering into Jericho and you find two other blind men there who are crying out something very similar and they say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us and he also heals them there. But one thing that you should know as you read through the Bible and you look through the Old Testament especially is that blindness is often seen as a curse of God. So if you look, for example, at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you find that the men who wanted to attack Lot basically in his, in his house and drag them out, the people there out by force, are struck with divine blindness in Genesis 19, so much so that they groped around in the darkness and they couldn't actually find the door. Um, um, the book of Exodus tells us about the 10 plagues of Egypt, and the ninth plague is actually a plague of supernatural darkness in which the Egyptians are basically deprived of light and are unable to see. So they have this kind of blindness, even though they weren't individually blind, it was a general blindness in their society. See, with this kind of backdrop in the Old Testament, it's no wonder then that there were Jews at the time of Jesus who thought that blindness was probably the judgment of God in someone's life. That's why when you read John chapter 9 and you find this interesting story about a man who was blind from birth, the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they ask this question. They say, Rabbi, who is it that sinned here? Was it this man or was it his parents that sinned? And you know what their assumption is here is that the assumption is that if you're seeing someone who is blind here, especially from birth, somebody must have done something really, really wrong. Now, in today's world, um, you know, that was their culture. In today's world, we look at something like that, we feel very uncomfortable because we know that's not politically correct, you know what I'm saying? Like, it would be the equivalent of going out to the parking lot outside, looking at a handicapped parking spot and watching someone park there and say, who, hey, who do you think sinned? Was it that person or was it their parents that resulted in them being disabled? I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing, you know what I mean, to say, because really, is that, is that the instant connection that you're going to make? But you have to remember, this is the way that many people thought in that culture at that time. See, to, to be blind then was to be thought of perhaps as being under the curse of God and really placed you in a place where you were a social outcast. Now, these men know their condition is desperate. They are blind. They are at the fringes of society. And the only thing they can do is they can beg God for mercy. And so the text tells us that they cry out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, this phrase, have mercy on us, is actually used multiple times in Matthew's gospel by desperate people. You can read the story about a Canaanite woman who has a demonized daughter as well, and she does the same thing. She begs Jesus and says the same words, have mercy on me, Jesus, please help me. There's another man later in the book of Matthew as well who also is a demon-possessed you know, son. He brings it to the disciples. They can't help him. He says, Jesus, have mercy on me. And, and if you read like the Old Testament, once again, you find that this language of mercy comes straight out of an understanding of the Bible. So for example, if you look at the book of Psalms, there are on 17 separate occasions where the psalmist actually prays to God and says, God, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, look favorably on me, incline your ear to my pleas. Over and over again, the psalmists actually teach us to pray this way. How do you approach God? You approach God actually by coming to him and begging him for mercy. See, it's biblical language throughout here. 
the background of what's going on, even the language that these blind men are using is shaped by the Old Testament. This is how God actually wants us to approach it because as he says, I am a God who is steadfast in love. I am a merciful God. You would never ask for mercy from someone who is merciless, but this is the way the Father wants us to come to know him. And honestly, this should be incredibly comforting for us as believers. If God is merciful by nature, it's true then what the scriptures imply about him is that those who come to him in repentance, humbly on their knees, he will never cast out. See, you can never be too low for God. He is always happy to accept you if you come to him on your knees. But the truth of the matter is you can be too tall in that the gate to heaven, the doorway to it, cannot be entered if you are standing tall and proud. You can only enter on your knees. You know, our text here tells us that these two blind men threw themselves on the mercy of God, and they literally, it says here, it sounds like they followed Jesus to his house. Perhaps Jesus invited them to come when they were yelling at him in public. It doesn't exactly tell us. But somehow or another, it says Jesus entered the house, and the blind men basically followed him in there. Perhaps he invited them in. Maybe it was his home. Maybe it was Peter's home. Perhaps it was uh, just a, you know, one of those places uh, like an Airbnb kind of thing, you know, sort of like a Jesus on his itinerant ministry. Somebody gave him a place to stay, and he just said, here, come on in. Come on in, and, and let me do it. You know, I, I, can't, I couldn't read this passage and imagine what's it like to be Jesus. You know, he was the most busy and in-demand person in the world. No way. He couldn't even take a vacation. Imagine you're done with work. I mean, I, I struggle enough with it saying that there's times I just have to shut off my phone. Because with technology, now people can reach you at any particular time. There's times I just, I just need to be alone with God and just to think. Jesus didn't even have the ability to shut off his cell phone. He's here going to the house wherever he is staying. And still there's a crowd of people following after him, including these blind men. And he doesn't turn them away. Probably wanted to rest, but he says, okay, come on in, please. What do you want me to do for you? And he ministers to them. So Jesus, you know, here is, I mean, you, you just think about it. Like, if you have a need in your life, look at the way that he treats these blind men. They're outcast society. He's probably tired after a day of ministry, and yet here he is taking care of them. They find themselves on the inside as they come to Jesus for mercy. Now, what's interesting about the blind men's plea is not only do they say, have mercy on us, but they use a particular phrase to address him. They say, son of David... Now, this is another phrase which is fascinating because it's drawn straight again from the Old Testament. And it comes really sort of from the 2 Samuel chapter 7, right? They don't call him master. They don't call him rabbi. They don't call him Lord, but they actually call him son of David. Now, as you've been going through the book of Matthew, you realize that in the whole gospel of Matthew, this is the very first time that anyone addresses Jesus as the son of David. The phrase actually has appeared one other time at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, and that's in Matthew's introduction. Chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew explains to us that Jesus stands in his family tree in the line and the lineage of David. He is David's son. Now, this is really important at the outset because Matthew's point in beginning his Gospel with the genealogy is to establish Jesus' credentials. So how do you know that this Jesus, who he's going to paint a picture for us, is the rightful king that's supposed to sit on Israel's throne and is going to rule the entire world? It's because, he says, he stands in the line of the promise. There was a promise that was made to David, and this Jesus has the right pedigree to be able to fulfill that promise of a king who would come. Now, the story finds its roots in 2 Samuel chapter 7, in which is known is as the Davidic covenant or the promise to David. And the story goes basically that David is thinking about God and saying, God, I want to build you a house. I want to build you a temple so that people can come and worship you in. And as he's, and, 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 and uh, he wants to do this, the prophet tells him, okay, go ahead, go do all that's in your heart. But then God speaks actually through the prophet to David and tells him, no, 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 actually, you're going to do something else. And this is what he says. David, when your days are fulfilled, verse 12 to 16, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be to him a father. He'll be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I'll discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In other words, what it's saying here is, David, you wanted to build me a house? 
guess what? I'll do you one better. I'm going to build you a house, not one out of bricks and stone, but actually a lineage, a line of kings, and there will always be one to sit on your throne, and there will be a rulership forever. See, this, this changes the world. And I think that these guys, these, these biblically thinking blind men who knew the scriptures, knew about these things, were thinking of these prophecies, were thinking of these Old Testament covenant promises, and they had connected the dots together about who Jesus actually was. There are other passages that speak about, not just about the son of David, that is the Messiah and what he would do. So, for example, Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 to 8, actually is a passage that describes what the entire messianic age or the kingdom is going to look like. I'll read it for you. Isaiah speaking, Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And there will be a highway there and it shall be called the way of holiness, and the unclean shall not pass over it. It will belong to those who walk on the way, and they will not go astray. That's Isaiah's description of the messianic age. That's not the only place where Isaiah gives us a glimpse and a picture of it. For example, in Isaiah 42, which is the first of four what are called the servant songs. They're the, the prophecies of God about what his precious servant would do. So verse 1 of chapter 42 says, Behold my servant whom I've chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit in him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And then you skip down afterwards to verses 6 and 7. It says this, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand. I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Verse 7, to open the eyes that are blind and to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, those who sit in darkness. See, and there are actually multiple passages like this in the Old Testament that speak about the glories of the Messianic kingdom. See, in the Old Testament, when you go through the whole Old Testament, there's actually no account, no miracle, actually, of giving sight to the blind. None. The first miracle of giving sight to the blind is actually found in the New Testament. And why this is important is because giving sight to the blind is actually something that belongs to God alone. Like Psalm 146 verse 8 says, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down and the Lord loves the righteousness. So righteous. So in other words, all this to say is that healing the blind in the mind of the first century Jew was a power that was not only associated with God, but it was a power and a sight and a, si a sign that if you saw it was a marker of the new messianic age that God had foretold would come and that would transform and change everything, not only the geography of the land, but the very hearts of people as well. It would promise freedom for the, the Jewish people and peace on the earth. When people in the Old Testament saw the blind being able to see, it was the calling card and the hallmark of the Messiah, and they knew that that's who he was and that the king would return and the son of David would take his rightful place. See, see, you realize what's so amazing about these men in just the few words that they have to say. See, you know, it's Matthew's gospel up until this point, like I said, has not had any healings of blind people. It's possible that Jesus healed some, but it's, it's quite possible that he had not at this point as he's doing one miracle after another. These blind men had not seen Jesus heal anyone blind before, quite literally. I mean, because also they were blind and probably maybe they had not even heard of it. But somehow or another, knowing the Bible, knowing the prophecies of Isaiah, connecting the dots there about all these things that Jesus was doing, calming the, the storms, healing people, raising the dead, they said, these are markers of the messianic kingdom. Wait a minute, if these are markers of the messianic kingdom, one of the markers of the Messiah is that he heals the blind. If he is that promised Messiah, then there is something he can do for us. We've never seen him heal anyone blind before, but I know if he is who he says he is, if he is the promised one, he can do this. And so I think by faith, they go up to Jesus, they call out and they cry, they follow him home and they say, we need him because he alone can help us. They believe him to be not just some miracle worker, but they say, you are the son of David. You are the one who ushers in the messianic kingdom. 
we believe. You are the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies. And so they come in faith. They believe, they ask, and they ask for something that they know only the Messiah can do in complete faith. Which is why when Jesus says to them, do you believe I'm able to do this? Their answer to him is immediate and unequivocal, yes, we do. You know, this has huge implications for us, church, as we think about this. See, if you believe what the word of God has to say about Jesus, and I know that some of you sitting here today either haven't been in church for a while, some of you are not believers in Jesus, but the same thing, if you believe like those blind men, what the word of God had to say about the Messiah, and you hear these things about him and these stories, you are also faced with this question. You know, maybe you're, you're thinking to yourself, so like, Lord, I, I believe maybe that, 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 that some of these things, but really, are you who you say you are? How do we know that this isn't a legend? Or maybe you're a Christian sitting here today and you're thinking to yourself, God, okay, I believe you're a God. I know that you can do anything, but, but personally, I just, I just don't know. I've heard a story about how you've helped someone with cancer. I've heard a story about how you helped someone else find a job, but is this possible in my own life? I know what your word says about you, but I'm struggling right now to actually believe this, that you are the Messiah and that promised one. Can you actually help me? This is the question that we have to ask, right? These men found this Messiah to be their Messiah, and they believed that he could do something, though they had never seen it, because they believed that who he was, he was who he said he was. See, what you ask God for in your prayer life, how you live, shows what you really believe deep down inside your heart. See, what do you run to for safety when everything goes wrong in your life? Do you run to your own wisdom and plans, or do you run to actually your prayer closet, and you throw yourself before God and say, it's you actually that I need? Where do you turn to? See, do you walk by faith into the strange unknowns of a new job, a new country, uh, you know, having a new home, or having your financial future, future not all mapped out because you've been generous to the poor? Or do you just always live planning out everything, preserving your life at all particular costs? Do you take risks for Jesus because you say, it's about following him? What do you actually live by? You may say you believe in God as well, but what do you actually live by? See, the proof is in how you go to Jesus or whether you go to the things of this world. You know, when I was a teenager, I had a chance to go to Toronto because I was playing in the national chess tournament there, and I was like, yeah, I'm excited to play chess. Like, you know, other people go to play hockey and they travel. I went to travel for chess, you know. I was excited about this thing, but one of the things, I wanted to do two things while I was there. One is I wanted to see the Hockey Hall of Fame because I liked hockey. I wasn't very good at it, you know what I mean? But and the second thing I wanted to see was I wanted to see the CN Tower. Actually, out of curiosity, how many of you have been to the CN Tower in Ontario before? Oh, okay, good, a handful of people. You know, that's good. I'm not the only one. I'll tell you what, the CN Tower, in case you don't know, is the tallest freestanding structure in all of North and South America. It's like over 114 stories tall. It's a long elevator ride to get up there. And uh, it's essentially about 1,000 feet, sort of the observation deck, I mean, above, uh, above ground. And one of the scariest things about it is that you can actually get up there onto the uh, observation deck, and you can walk around, and there's this thing uh, that is absolutely terrifying. It's called the glass floor. Okay, and so the glass floor basically is is, is you, know, you go out onto it, and then you look down, and it's just, you can see the city laid out before. It's all tiny looking, and you realize that underneath your feet, if that glass was not there, it's a thousand foot drop, you know, just, just the bottom. And, and it was terrifying, you know, I mean, for me, and, and, and to be honest, I was, I was a chicken, you know, and I, I look at that, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go do the glass floor, and I get up there as well, and I get over the edge, and I kind of like peer, and I'm like, oh, I don't know about this, this glass. And you know, of course, the tour guys there, they all, they all tell you the same, they tell you the same thing. Actually, this is very safe, you know. Uh, apparently, it can take the weight of 35, 35 moose. And I go, like Canadian moose? Are those like baby moose? You know, like what kind of moose, you know, is that? And then you read all this stuff. They say, actually, the floor of the CN Tower and its glass floor is, is engineered to be structurally five times as strong as the, as the floor of any commercial building. And you know all these things going up, right? That you read it on the signs, right? The, guy, the guides swear by it, whatever. They do these things. But when you actually get up there, right, you find out very much whether you believe the facts or you believe your own eyes. And to my shame, I find myself there, you know, on the multiple, there's multiple glass blocks, you know, and then the little crossbars and the concrete there. And I find myself inching away, or like walking, you know, like along, <laughs> along the crossbars, thinking that this is probably going to save me instead and I'm not going to drop to my death. 
You know, I, I, I was, uh, the thing that I hate about that is you have these kids who have no fear or no shame, and they're like running and jumping like, yeah, right? And they're stomping on the glass, like wondering if they can get it. I'm like, what are you doing? You crazy kids, right? See, you, you, in that moment, you're, you're faced with this reality, and you, you come to say, do I actually believe what is said about this? I know this to be true. I know this. I have a better chance of dying in an office building because Chances are the office building is not as strongly built as this structure, which is five times stronger than any floor, but my eyes tell me I'm more likely to die here. And I think this is an analogy that just fits when it comes to the Christian world and the Christian fame. See, you can see all of the world around you, you know, and you run into crises, whatever, and you have your glass floor moment, right? You're like looking through these things like, God, you know, right now, like, I feel like the bottom is going to drop out from me. But what Jesus says here is that if, if, if he is the son of God, if he is the son of David, if he is truly the Messiah to come, having him in your life, although you can see the bottom and you look at the terrible troubles, you say, standing on me right now, I'm five times stronger, 10 times, 50 times, I'm infinitely stronger than anything else that you can stand on. I know that the financial system of this world, your job, and all the things that you think that in this world normally give you safety and security as well, but I need you to understand that those things are nowhere near as safe with me. I know that when you follow me, you might be persecuted, you might suffer, and you will not know how things are going to turn out, humanly speaking. But does it not say in the Bible, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Why does, why does Paul say that in his letter? The reason he says that is because the Christian life is going to be full of times in which you will be anxious, you will be scared, and in those moments, God doesn't take away the actual fear, but he says, don't worry. The peace of God that surpasses even your understanding. Your understanding that says, I'm looking right now at a major drop. Things do not look good. I don't know how this is going to work. I says, don't worry. Peace of God will settle on your soul. You have no reason, humanly speaking, to be able to figure this out on your own. But God is with you. He will take care of you if you only walk in integrity, trust him, and abide by his holiness. All of us as Christians are faced with the glass floor moment, just like these men. The question we have to ask in our own lives is, will we trust our eyes, the things of this world, or will we say, I will stand over a drop as long as Jesus is the one who is underneath my feet because he is far more sure. See, Jesus calls us to a life of faith. I think it's really important for us to understand here that, you know, when I speak with people from other cultures and other faiths, you know, and they say, well, you're, you, you believe in faith, and I believe in science. And I say, you know, actually, no. I mean, you, the implication, I get it. You, you think that faith is some sort of this speculative, you know, thing. When in actuality, true Christianity is grounded in historical fact. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The eyewitness accounts that are recorded for us in the Gospels. The 500 or so people who saw the resurrected Christ as well, whose names are recorded that we have. The missionary journeys, the testimonies of Christians throughout the centuries who have spoken up for Jesus, died for his name, and have said that Jesus has brought them immense comfort. He lives today and continues to do work. 2,000 years the church has continued on. You think maybe that there's something there? Yeah, I read, uh, I was reading this week about dark matter, actually, in the universe, you know, and it's very, very crazy stuff, you know, they've only recently figured out how to detect gar- dark matter in the universe, and you're like, yeah, what exactly is dark matter? It's something you can't see, it doesn't react to light, whatever. How do you know it's there? Well, part of the reason they know it's there is because of the way that it disturbs things in space. When they do their, scientists do their brainy calculations, and they figure out stuff, they're like, huh, stuff, something in that black sky up there doesn't look right, and the only way to explain it is something that doesn't react with light, it doesn't, it seems to have, you know, some, some way, it pulls things and it changes stuff. The only way to explain it is by something whose effects we can see, but we can never touch, we can never directly observe, but it has to be there. Same thing, I think, when it comes many times with Christianity and some of these things. We see the effects of Jesus on our world. We see his effects on people's lives. We see his effects in our own lives as well. And though we have not seen him, we have not tasted him, we have not touched him, Jesus says, blessed are you who have not seen and yet have believed, just like these individuals here. He calls us to a life of faith. And this is what those guys do. And he rewards them. Look at verse 30 to 31. 
And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. And they went away, and they spread his fame throughout all of their district, you know. See, their, their faith makes them whole. They've put their trust in Jesus. But there's this odd section on here of like, why does Jesus tell them sternly, don't talk about it? Now, just to be clear, I don't think he's saying here to these guys, I want you to go around and continue to pretend like you're blind, right? Like when you're in public, put on, put on some blinders, get your cane out and pretend to walk around and don't show anyone you're blind. I don't think that's what he means here, okay? I think that would be ludicrous, and eventually people would kind of figure out that, hey, you're not really blind, are you, anymore? What, what gives with you? Have? I don't think that's actually what he's forbidding them from speaking. Uh, I think the don't tell anyone thing has to do with this sort of uh, injunction that Jesus has given multiple times throughout the Gospels, and it has to do really with who he is as the Christ, or this title, the Christ, okay, who they acknowledge him to be, the son of David. See, like, um, when you read, for example, in Matthew 16 and other places, uh, you know, Peter confessing that Jesus is the Christ, uh, Jesus says, please don't tell anyone I'm the Christ. The whole point here is that in the, the time of the Jews in that time, many people thought the Messiah was going to be a conquering figure, He's here to bring in a new age, but he's here also to get rid of the Romans. So he's going to be a, a, a political figure and a warrior. And you can see this actually in the book of John, where after Jesus feeds 5,000 people by taking five loaves and dividing it up, the people say, oh my goodness, this is the prophet who is coming into the world. And John 6, 15 says the people actually try to grab Jesus and make him king by force. In other words, they say, this guy can feed an army from just five loaves. I mean, if anybody's going to be our military commander to get rid of the Romans, let's take him and let's do this. And Jesus, knowing what they want, says, I'm not that kind of king. And he actually withdraws and runs away to a mountain. See, this is so important to understand why Jesus would rather prefer calling himself the son of man because that title, son of, uh, son of God, the Christ was infused with many of their Zionistic, militaristic expectations. And he was saying, I have want no part in that. And the reason why is because if Jesus actually came as a conquering king and he slaughtered the Romans and he brought in a cures for blindness and he healed the lame and he also gave the deaf the ability to hear, it would be all fine and dandy for you and I, but the minute that we die and we face the wrath of God by ourselves, we would all be in eternal trouble. See, the glory of Jesus is that he did not come first as a conquering king because if he had come as a conquering king, God would have to destroy us for our sins. But Jesus comes actually as a servant to be a sacrifice for our sins so that one day you and I, even if we die of cancer, even if we die blind in this world, will ultimately have the spiritual blindness removed from us and we will live in the presence of God full for all of eternity. This is why Jesus came. This is who the Messiah really is, the one who deals with our sin problem, our ultimate spiritual blindness before God. These guys saw him actually for who he was, but Jesus didn't want any confusion, so he said, don't go and blab, but they disobey his instructions, and they go and do it. See, I think this is the call to us, you know, as Christians, is to respond like these men. I think obedience is required, but the question is for us. Do we see with the eyes of faith, do we see Jesus for who he actually is and say, Jesus, I want you to be the one who stands underneath my feet throughout the trials of life, just as these men did? This is the call for us, actually, in this passage. Matthew has been building a case all the way up to this point. He is the promised one. You have seen his power. Will you not submit to him, reader? Do you not see that he is God? This is the response that's called for for us. But there is one other way to respond negatively here. And look with me at verses 32 to 34, okay? As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him, and when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. You know, so the blind men are heading out, and other people are heading in. Jesus does more miraculous work. People are astounded. But the Pharisees who see this thing look at that and they say, absolutely not. It's not a miracle of God's origin, but this is straight up the work of the devil. They saw the miracles of Jesus, and yet it did nothing for them. Worse yet, actually, they called it the exact opposite of what it really was. This is the work of Satan. You know, as I wrap this up, I want to just point out three things, you know, from this. Three responses, three observations, you know, here. First one, number one, sometimes we learn from this, faith actually produces miracles. 
Faith sometimes produces miracles. See, these men believed in Jesus, and they got exactly what they asked for. They were healed. You know, and I, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard in believers' lives. Some of you actually have experienced healing in your own life as well as God. You've gone to him in prayer. He's miraculously done things for you. I'm reminded of the story just in our church this last summer as one of the fathers had a, had a young boy, you know, and he fell out. I don't know, many of you will remember this. He fell actually out of the second story window. And I got the call afterwards that basically he was being rushed to hospital and he had a fractured and broken skull. And, and I immediately sent out a note. I said, we've got to pray for him as a church. We sent out everywhere. His father said, please pray for him. We need God right now. He's in critical condition in the ICU. We're praying for this kid as well. Next day, I find out afterwards that um, there's been a remarkable change. They take him basically for x-rays, and the skull is fused together, and the crack is gone. And, and I look at that, and I go, oh, my goodness. Like, what actually happened? Like, he was in the ICU and, like, sedated, and his skull is fused together. He's healed now. All that remains is a little bit of blood. They don't know what to do with him because he doesn't have a critical brain injury. He doesn't have a critical skull injury anymore. They say, well, I don't know. Doctors just release him from, from, from the hospital within days. And they share the story in church. I mean, what is that when you look at that? Does God do this all the time? Not all the time, but many times when his children are desperate and we pray to him, does he do miracles? Yes, he does. He does. The doctors were shocked, you know, at this, but we know what it is. That's a miracle. Yes, God does do things like this. But there's also something else that occurs. Is sometimes the reverse occurs, and that is sometimes miracles actually produce faith. This is also what happens in this particular case. People see him. They see him casting out a demon, and they say, never has anything been done like this in Israel. And the miracle is actually what leads people to be able to worship the living God. And you've seen this as well in life. Sometimes God does it this way instead. Like, for example, I was thinking about a time I'd been witnessing, actually, to a, these uh, non-Christian girls, and I think I've shared this story with a number of you before, about how I, was, I actually went to a birthday party for a friend of mine, sorry, a farewell party for a friend of mine who was leaving for Japan, and I get this cryptic text from these, uh, these individuals saying, please come now to, to a restaurant. Um, and I'm like, I'm busy, I, I'm seeing my friend off for Japan, like, this is not a convenient time. I just felt like God was saying, oh, I need to go. And so I have to say goodbye to everyone at the party. I say, I can't stay. I know you're leaving for Japan. I'm so sorry, but I just feel I need to go. Get in my car. I drive out to this restaurant. I find the two of them sitting there. And I said, uh, what, what gives? Like, what's going on? And they said, um, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we called you here we, because we had been praying. And we wanted to see. We just felt like we wanted to know if God was real. So we prayed and we asked God to please interrupt Sam Chua, whatever he's doing, and make him come over here and visit with us. And I said, you, I wanted to say, you, you called me out just for that? You know what I mean? Like, he's leaving for Japan. Like, I'm not going to see him again, you know, for I don't know how long. And I thought to myself, like, no, this is an amazing thing. With their, their little infantile faith, they were just, for some reason, they just felt like they needed a little miracle in life. And, and for them, they just felt like if, if they could text me and I would be willing to move from wherever I was and show up at this place without explaining to me anything, they just felt like probably God is in control here. You know, they ended up later becoming believers through other amazing things. But, you know, God works with us through this way. Sometimes it works this way as well. The last thing that I think we, we realize from this is that sometimes miracles actually have the opposite effect in that they produce opposition. See, the Pharisees looked at the same miracles of God, and it produced no faith in them whatsoever, but produced the opposite. They wanted to kill him instead. And I think this is no different than today when people look at Christianity and they think it's all about control. It's negative. Religion is an opiate for the masses. It's frowned on. It's about power. People like you who are pastors, you know, are like the scum of the earth because you fleece people of their money and you make a living off them, preying on their sensibilities. Some are extremely negative about the things of God. Or perhaps they're not that negative. They would just simply say, I can't believe any of this unless I see God actually do a miracle in my own life. I need some proof. And to that, many times I would say, like, do you actually know yourself that well? Do you really think that's what you need? You know, the Bible talks about it. It doesn't always work like that. You know, there's a story, right, of the rich man and Lazarus, right? And the rich man ends up in a place of fire, and he says to Father Abraham, please go tell my brothers about this horrible place. And Abraham looks at him and says, they've got the law and the prophets. They've got God's word. And I tell you, if they don't believe that, even if one were to rise from the dead, they will not believe. And it's astounding to think about that, saying like, Really? If a dead relative came back, like in Scrooge, Marley, you know, from the grave, whatever, rise up, Scrooge, you know, and speaks to you. And say, Do you not think that would change you, whatever? God in his infinite wisdom says, it won't. 
Not sometimes it will, but don't count on it being the de facto thing. That is what you need to change you. The human heart is actually that hard. And here's an example. The Pharisees saw the Son of God face to face, and they had the nerve and the gall to call his work the work of the devil. That actually might be you if you saw him face to face. See, in other ways, you could try to ignore him, and you say, well, I just think Jesus is a great teacher, but, but, but honestly, he doesn't allow you to do that. He either is the God who does miracles and is who he says he is and is the only way, the truth, and the life, the only one who can forgive your sins before God, the only one who dares to speak to you and say you are so wretched that it takes my death on the cross in order to save you from your sin. That's how heinous your sins are. All of your good deeds, your goodness, the life that you think that you're good. I'm a fairly good person. I'm a decent human being. I haven't killed anyone. I work a good job. Jesus looks right at that and says, unfortunately, that is rubbish. It is rubbish. If it were so, why would I have to die on the cross if you were actually that decent? I'm telling you, my death on the cross is because you are actually that bad. I know you don't see that in terms of your own assessment of yourself, but I'm telling you that it's true. Are you going to accept my word as the God of all the universe about your own condition, or are you going to walk by your own sight? See, the question is, who has authority? When I walked on the floor of that CN Tower, eventually I got some courage to step out onto the glass floor. As I watched other people stomping on it as well, and as I came to believe that the engineers were probably smarter than I was and had done a good job there and knew that if they had uh, engineered a catastrophic failure, they would probably lose their careers and go to jail for the rest of their lives. So based on that knowledge and other things, eventually I kind of did step out onto the floor just to, just to kind of test it, and I'm still here today. So it means that it's, it's, it works, you know, it functions. It's the same thing in you. Who has the authority? Who is the engineer who designed you? This is what he says about you and your condition. And the question is, can you accept his authority over your life, above and beyond your own? And will you submit to him as he calls out to you across the ages and says, come to me, my child? Can you see here? He reaches out to those who are broken and those who are needy. No matter where you are today in life, whatever needs you might have, the Son of God is merciful and ready to meet with you. And he says, come, have faith in the one who has come to save you from your own sins. He is no liar. He calls to you today, whether you're a Christian or not, in some way or another to submit your life to him and to step out across there on the floor. Is Jesus who he says he is? Because if he is, he can be trusted. And even if you stand right now in your life in a terrible situation where you feel like you're a thousand feet over thin air, that glass, that Jesus Christ is strong. He will never break. And you 